At the end of the 19th century, marriage remained the preferred choice of many women. Young white women and daughters of immigrants still had few options. Only the lucky few might acquire the skills to become printers or portrait painters, teachers or clerical workers, skills that would enable them to support themselves without husbands and perhaps their aging parents as well. Economic independence would be a hard-won goal for these few. But among the better educated and more affluent, marriage, heterosexual marriage, became increasingly unpopular. To some extent, this was influenced by developments in education. A few co-educational colleges had admitted women in the 1830s and 40s, Antioch and Oberlin, for example. The land-grant colleges of the 1860s accepted women to special programs. To be sure, there were exceptions. Mount Holyoke College was founded in 1837 to give women an education the equivalent of men. Rockford Seminary for Young Ladies, the alma mater of Jane Addams, opened in 1847. But in the post-Civil War period, the numbers of women's colleges burgeoned. Vassar opened its doors in 1865, Wellesley in 1870, Smith in 1871, followed by the remaining seven sisters' colleges, culminating with Barnard in 1889. These colleges provided for women an education which they boasted was the equivalent of an education for men. They were sought out by young women from families of means who wanted to improve their lives before going out into the world. Perhaps ironically, the young graduates discovered that they were more interested in putting their educations to use than they were in confining themselves to households. The women's colleges launched a generation of educated women into a world with few alternatives for them. About half of their early graduates never married. Many of them, like Jane Addams, returned home after graduation not knowing what they wanted to do. Addams spent a year in distress fighting off a nervous breakdown before her stepmother took her off for a year in Europe where she discovered her calling. In England, Adams discovered Toynbee Hall, a house of university graduates located in the heart of the poorest section of London and dedicated to serving its community by becoming part of it. Known as a settlement house because its occupants, men and women, settled with their families in the community they served, Toynbee Hall became a model emulated many times over in the United States. Jane Addams returned to Chicago and with her friend Ellen Gates Starr founded Hull House, a place where women might live together to provide examples of middle-class life to the women of the neighborhood and as well to serve as spearheads voices for the municipal reforms that would be needed to permit the poorest immigrants to live decent lives. Hull House became a gathering place for neighborhood women. It provided nurseries for their children, lessons in cooking and marketing to the mothers, setting a table and furnishing a kitchen to all wives. It offered meeting rooms to working men trying to organize trade unions or assert claims to recognition. Not long after its founding, Hull House women recognized the need for such amenities as street sanitation, running water, better housing, and playgrounds. Ultimately, like many of the settlements founded all over the country, Hull House became a voice for working people. Some social settlements included married couples and single men as well as women, but most started when well-off women like Adams lived and joined with young female college graduates 
many of them from families devoted to religious service. Settlement residents did not generally marry, though many shared lifelong partnerships with other women. Adams, for example, had a lifelong partnership with Mary Rose Smith, who lived with her at Hull House, contributed to the Hull House community, and was in every sense her partner. Hull House also housed women like Florence Kelly, who returned from Europe separated from her husband and with three children. She sent the children to live with friends and joined the Hull House community where she learned the skills that would later enable her to spend a lifetime as a social reformer. Lillian Wald, who started the Henry Street Settlement in New York, followed a path similar to that of Adams. Born in 1867, she sought admission to Vassar at the age of 16. Vassar turned her down because she was too young, so she enrolled instead in a nursing program. With the help of family money and that of a philanthropist named Jacob Schiff, who was a family friend, as well as with the help of a cohort of female friends, Wald founded the Henry Street Settlement. There, she focused initially on providing health services and then turned the settlement into an advocacy center for public health. With her nurses' training, she explored the diseases endemic in the neighborhood, took care of women who could not afford doctors, and ultimately founded the Visiting Nurses Association, which still exists today. Like most women of that period, Wald did not confine herself to a single project, nor did she reflect a single identity. Jewish by birth, she located her settlement in the heart of the Jewish Lower East Side. But she bonded with leaders of the African-American community and in 1909 joined with W.E.B. Du Bois, Ida B. Wells Barnett and others to help found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. Along with Jane Addams and other women of their generation, Wald later helped to create the Women's Peace Party, which in the years surrounding World War I became perhaps the most respected anti-war group. At this point, Adams, Wald, and others clearly believed that advocacy for peace was a woman's issue. <laughs>